Welcome back guys to the week's closet and today we're watching apparently something that we skipped a while ago I honestly thought we we're done with it, but World of Remnant and you saw it in the title uh, The last four which are Between Kingdoms, Faunus, Shinida's Company and The Great War uh, We're also doing this because of the fact that since we kind of ran out of Ruby content and honestly by, by all means just give you this Because uh, it, it is kind of sad. It's kind of sad that we're not doing it anymore. Oh for, for the time being But hiatus, hiatus, the time being Yeah Anyway so, with that said, guys, honestly, not much to say. Pro hopefully, this actually has something new for us to watch. Because I feel like by volume 8, you should know a lot of these things by now. But let's see. I would hope, yeah. Yeah. Alrighty, boys and girls and uh, cats, if you're watching us. I don't know. From the moment you join our Patreon, you get access to the uncuts of all the different shows that we've done. As well as access to our Discord, where you get to chat with us or amongst yourselves about any games, shows, or movies. If you choose to jump into our we've tied in tier you'll have access to our time exclusive shows these shows will either be ahead or unavailable to watch in our youtube attack on time used to be there jujutsu kaisen just finished mob cycle is starting and invincible has been over there for over a year and for the full metal weeks not only do you get shown off here but you get one week early access to the shows currently on the screen as well as staying ahead into our bible weekly podcast and you also get to vote and watch our monthly Anka movie. I hope you guys are having a wonderful day and let's start the video. Furries are welcome. Fairy, uh, furries, <laughs> and oh, this is fairies. I'm like, I mean, that too. No, I don't wanna, Mr. Beast, I, I love you, but no. Between kingdoms, there are rooms. So now you know more about the Do kingdoms. Do you want me to lower the volume? But what's between the uh, big sure. cities? Is this true? <laughs> All right, the easy answer is my, my I'm being thrown off because Vic Mignogna is back. They're out there. <laughs> probably won't go well if you run into one. That's okay, because you're a huntsman. Or huntress. And you've trained at one of the major academies, so you're probably fine. Just don't get yourself overrun by a pack of them. And you did. Now, after a long day of killing... Sounds like a skill world, issue. You're going to probably want to stop at a small town inn. Small villages dot the land between the major cities. You might ask, with the wilderness being so dangerous, why not just live in the big cities? Well, that life isn't meant for everyone. These small towns are founded by people that have a problem with the kingdoms, or don't want to deal with the kingdom's problems, or maybe just enjoy the simpler life. So just real life. Chances in the wild <laughs> and so in the kingdom. That's the reason mm -hmm. most people don't live in LA or New York. About as well as you think. Yeah, like you need people to fend the founders are smart, then there's a good chance these towns can survive for the same reason the kingdoms continue to. Natural barriers, strong defenses, stubborn citizens <laughs> if you don't have at least a few of those then you know, the chances of a town lasting more than a year isn't great unfortunately it's not just the grim running around ruining towns raven Wandering bandits are another threat these groups of usually fairly skilled fighters travel the lands never settling in one place they often prey on convoys sending goods between kingdoms but that's not all these raiders will often wait for a town to be at its weakest, maybe after a grim attack or while its fighters are out hunting, before finally moving in at night and striking. Bunch of jerks. <laughs> the worst part is, if the grim hadn't attacked before, you'd better be damn sure they will now. And you can't exactly have bandits raid your town without at least a few negative emotions. Yep. This is also why bandits never stay in the towns they conquer. With attitudes like the ones they have, Grimm tend to be pretty interested in them as well. As long as they keep moving, they've got a better chance of survival. Besides these small towns, the areas between kingdoms really depend on the continent. Harsh deserts, icy tundras, lush forests, you name it. At this point, pretty much every inch of remnant has been mapped out. Although there are some areas that no one's gone into and come out alive. Like our course, girls. Somewhere out there is where she is. Exactly. That girl's uh, grim generating farm is at. 
I mean, do you, I don't think we have anything much to say on that one. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I thought. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is that I think the Great War is actually something that I'm interested in watching. Yeah. We don't actually know a ton about that. Yeah, we actually, we they kind of like skipped around it and mentioned that it happened, but nothing about it. Mm-hmm. On is his flowers. You know, most of us spend a lot of time talking about mankind versus Grimm, but technically there is a third party in the mix. The Faunus. Third parties, man, you gotta hate them. You're not in the know. The Faunus are a species furries, of remnant that appear to be human in just about every way. Every way, but immediately one. after inviting. <laughs> I know. <right? laughs> single animalistic trait. Some more parrot than others. Ram horns, tiger claws, cat ears. I swear, on my huntsman's license, I once saw a guy regrow his severed lizard tail. Mm. I swear, no amount of drinking can make you forget that pretty picture. No, I mean, as it makes sense. Lizards can aware, regrow their tails. Faunus have been around as long as mankind, if not a little longer. History gets a little fuzzy past a certain but we do know that their kind and ours are completely compatible from a uh, biological standpoint. Oh, okay. Of course, of course, of course. Two wolf faunas, and you get a little wolf cub kiddo. A wolf faunus and a human also typically means your little bundle of joys teething phase could get a little dicey. But if you take a wolf faunus and a bull faunus, for example, it's a complete roll of the dice. For all you know, you could be cleaning up your son's shedded snake skin. That's so strange. That, okay, so there is actually something to learn here. Yeah. It comes to, well, a lot about the faunus. But science isn't the real problem. It's how we all get along. Or in this case... I was expecting something more like manticorish, you know, or like, I don't know. Something more related to both. The faunus. And honestly, it's not too hard to sympathize with that. Seeing something that looks like you and acts like you walk out of the forest and reveal a pair of fangs can be a little upsetting. Like most things man doesn't understand, all sorts of rumors and stories surround the faunus. People avoided them like the plague, pushing them out of settlements and sometimes even hunting them down. Man began to outnumber the faunus. And the faunus began to consider man nothing more than a hostile species. <laughs> Can't really blame them. Mm -hmm. These clashes between species were unavoidable, as land that was safe from the Grim was in constant short supply. But it was the Grim that finally brought humans and faunus together for the first time. A village in Sanus fell under attack, and the only reason anyone survived was because the humans and faunus united against their common enemy. It was a step in the right direction. And then they both kill each other. didn't fix everything. Once humanity learned they weren't so different from the faunas, they still used those differences as an excuse to exploit and alienate them. The treatment of the faunas differed around the world, and things wouldn't improve much for them until the Great War. Veil and vacuo against mantle and mystery. Ooh. A war unlike anyone had ever seen. And when it was over... The world was desperate to find compromises that would ensure they'd never see the likes of it again. Faunus were awarded equal rights as citizens of Remnant, and as an apology, they were given an entire continent of their own to do with as they pleased. That one in the corner. <laughs> there were some that saw this as fair and just. And February is their memorial month. It really was. <laughs> Technically. Holy <laughs> shit. Let's give them also the shortest <laughs> fucking <laughs> month. <laughs> still faunus all over the world. They so gave him the smallest fucking piece of land. Varies in quality from place to place, but menagerie will always be their safe haven. Here's the thing, though: you can only push and prod people so much before they reach a tipping point, and when you pack those people together, it just makes it all the easier for them to get organized and get even. What was it, White Fang? Yeah. I was about to say the Wolf. Wolf Fang. The Wolf Gang. The Wu-Tang Clan. 
Okay, so there was a bit to learn in that one. That was good. Yeah. I was honestly like, yeah, we know. First. Yeah, like, oh, we're going to fall asleep on this. Mm -hmm. I, I did like that little uh, bit of it being, hey, like, you know, if you mix and match, then you don't actually match. It's, you got to pray to RNG Jesus for a good a good role, I that's guess. That's so baby. wild because, like, it's it's so easy to find another family that's, di like, different and, you know, well, the older people want us, so mm -hmm. might as well. You know, it's not like all snake faunas is like attracted immediately to other snake faunas, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so that's interesting. And they did say, I wonder if, you know, a faunus and non faunus can still have a non faunus kid, you know? Because they did say, you know, faunus and, and non faunus has a faunus kid. So I wonder if the opposite is also true. I could see it, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't see why not. And you become Spock in the, in the new version of the movie. <laughs> uh, Spock, uh, whatever he got bullied because he had a, a human mother. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all, right, all right, what was I supposed to talk about next? Oh, oh, oh boy, yeah, okay. I've got a few words to say about this one. The Schnee Dust Company, bunch of self-entitled, monopolizing SNOBs. <laughs> only care about making a profit no matter how many little people they got to step on to make it happen <clears throat> but uh, that's just my opinion of course as you all know our survival in the world of remnant depends almost entirely on a crystallized substance known as dust it powers our city i feel like dust hasn't come up since volume one gives us a fighting chance against the creatures in what way do you mean? know like and any kind of relevance now that I was just I completely forgot that dust was in the show I mean uh, Weiss uses it all the time well, yeah it's just like it like it was in the opening narration and then it's just like and then that they were using dust to uh, get Atlas up or like the well yeah but they don't say we're using the dust it's just like it's not brought up it's just like a thing that's in the world I guess yeah it's not like a MacGuffin of any kind kingdom of mantle Formative period. They'd found themselves on the forefront of technology, but realized they depleted nearly all of their natural resources to do so. And that's where old Nick came in. Oh. Rather than watch his kingdom become dependent on the aid of others, young Nicholas Schnee decided to spend his days at combat school, his nights working alongside his father in the dwindling mantle mines, and any time in between learning everything he could about anything didn't know that kid had a fire in his belly when his father died, it's called hunger he left his son everything he had it wasn't much but it was enough for nick to set his plan into action he left school rallied all the men he could afford and set out on an expedition to find a dust deposit that could revitalize his kingdom and wouldn't you know he actually pulled it off Fast forward just a few years, and the name Schnee suddenly meant something. Quality, affordability, trust. See, all those years spent in combat school were so that Nick could personally oversee every new expedition. People appreciate a man who's willing to stick his neck out. And it's how the Schnee Dust Company earned the business of every kingdom and remnant. Unfortunately, it's also what led to an early retirement. Nick had started a family with Mister, and his body was tired. Years of working in dust mines can have some nasty side effects on your health. And so entered Jacques Jouet. Having married into the family, Jacques decided to take the Schnee name over his own. He mm. was uh, a lot of words I shouldn't repeat. Mm. But most importantly, he was a cunning businessman. Jock managed to convince Nicholas that he was the perfect man to run the SDC in his place. And from a certain point of view, he was right. Under Jacques's leadership, the Schnee Dust Company has become more profitable than ever, completely dominating the industry, but at the cost of the company's soul. Mm -hmm. The values, man. ...working conditions, doing whatever it takes to destroy the competition. Jacques Schnee doesn't care about cares about winning that and making sure he's got the best damn PR team in the world yeah you still gotta have that but 
if you're that guy. Yeah. And then the mech comes into play. No, yeah, basically what I was saying is that like the like my first impression of Ruby is that like dust is what makes the world go round. And it is, you mm-hmm. know, what makes the world of Remnant go round. Um, but like the Cortana opening narration was just like dust, this is dust. Do not forget about dust. Dust is the most important asset. And then the opening scene is Roman Torchwick stealing dust. dust yeah. And they're using dust. And then it's just like not like it's not as important in the show as I thought it was going to be. Uh, I, was- I think it's because like it I, it was trying to implant in your brain that is it's used so often in our daily lives that uh you know that we're trying to get our hands in it because ultimately that it was used to make the bombs in the in the second season yeah uh, yeah or volume and then you know so constantly and then afterwards i mean there wasn't what volume volume three there was really no need for a high concentration of dust but you still have uh this girl giving out like fucking dust pamphlets to people to like i'm not really to the team to actually have bullets of particular elements and stuff like yeah. that uh i forgot her name wise yes. um yeah, because uh, ultimately, you know, uh, these girls start using weapons with different elements. I mean, uh, bullets with different elements, Ruby. Uh, you we already had um, our girl, Blake, doing uh, they're using that with the semblance of hers to also. So, so like, there's there's definitely more. And again, the, the, the arena itself was made out of a lot of things that had dust. I think it was just that they try to push forward so hard the fact that it's such a vital thing for a regular thing a regular life that Mm -hmm. you know now that you understand that it is there it is there and it should always be in the back of your mind that it exists yeah i guess i just never really got its function because there's so many different kinds like from the opening narration it's just like this magical yeah yeah and then it's like oh it can you know alice floats because of it it's like, okay. It, it would have been great to see like a, a breakdown of all the different kinds of dusts. Mm-hmm. But the problem is that by doing that, I think that the the writers would be shooting themselves in the foot if they later need to explain something. It's like, ah, uh, we could have used dust, but we kind of fucked up because we didn't classify this as a dust property. Like Maybe. gravity being one of them, being like, why the fuck is there such a thing as gravity uh, dust, you know? Uh, granted, you can say magnetism, like some of our rocks, you know, could yeah. be gravity wise you know to a degree mm-hmm. uh so i wonder if that's why they need never wanted to ju- break it down just to give themselves enough space for any leeway uh but i get it because then i, I if it's made seen as a magical thing like it was shown pr- or like kind of foretold at the beginning then it will be more cool to see people using staffs and shit like that instead of just weapons with guns and swords <laughs> you know because it's right i much i much rather just use a staff of fire sh- fucking flow fryer and that's yeah. it and why would i need to shoot guns you know my fire can reach far fuck that you know this fire is so, cool yeah, yeah. El- fucking electricity bro like pew pew come on done jock schnee it it just further hits home how much i like him as a villain mm. in the show because it was what i was trying to explain to kevin because kevin was telling me i can't remember what villain he likes best uh, Tyrion. it was Tyrion. okay yeah which Tyrion, you know, uh, kind of had a glow up in Volume Seven, where he he did some stuff. Like everything that Jacques Chene does is immediate and completely impacts the characters, like on the dot. To where it's like, even though it's the end of the world, even though we have to stop Salem and she's the end goal, we can't actually do anything until we fix this situation. Mm. And it's crazy because Big Nicholas. <laughs> it was crazy to learn that he was actually like a good guy and he got his hands dirty and actually fucking built the company from the ground up and then Jacques Schnee just fucking ran it into the ground basically. Like I knew I knew for a fact that the grandpa was relatively good. And what I was surprised is knowing that it was like getting reminded that yes, this is the grandpa. It wasn't like two generations down. Mm-hmm. Like I honestly thought it was at least two generations of like a great great grandfather type of thing. Uh, but I do remember that back in uh, Ice Queendom, we did see Big Nicholas like having uh, Wise on, on his lap and, you know, putting her head and saying something. Yeah. I and forgot about that entirely. It's just like, I really thought at the beginning of the show that Weiss had some big time family issues and she does, but they all stem from just her father. Yeah. Like her father broke the entire family. It was his, 
you know, he was the housebreaker in the situation. He took the family name and he he broke the house. See, yeah, bro. Like, it's so wild to me that, like, that's in a single generation. This man just fucking destroyed a whole name. Yep. It's wild. Like, because, again, like, you would expect, and I'm, thinking, I'm pretty sure that's where you were at. You, you thought that, like, the... the company may have started right but then lost track over time something like that but it was not it was just legitimately jocks he's like fuck whatever your dad did i'm doing it worse (laughs) (laughs) oh my god yeah and you're right i feel like jocks like immediately like makes people feel like shit or immediately has something yeah so i i think whatever y'all both were arguing it's like i understand what kevin is saying it's because like Tyrion is kind of um Precedented, like he can do whatever the fuck he feels like at the moment, and you don't know what to expect. But the problem is that, like you said, like at that point, you you're either ready for a fight or he's mainly just serving a bigger purpose. Whereas Jocks is like, no, fuck, fuck everybody else. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> Plus, I don't want to get into like a whole discussion about all the villains, mm-hmm. but like we don't really know exactly why Salem's like henchmen. I call them henchmen, but like. Yeah. underlings are helping her like we know that they want to see her reach her end goal but it's like what are you gaining from it what drives you what, did she tell you you're gonna have like infinite power or something like that when she yeah because like cinder makes sense okay you will be stronger if you follow yes. me and you want power they made her really interesting because they had that and then she's like well what if i just play along and then at the end i take Slice it to, your nits. Yeah. yeah yeah so that that made cinder really cool um, but for the other characters, yeah, we're, like we're Hazel, like Hazel is one of them. It's like, okay, cool. Uh, is it just that you can keep killing Ospin over and over again to keep re- like revenging your sister? Like, it, like what's the end goal? Like, he's just gonna keep coming back. Mm-hmm. Like, what exactly? You just get satisfaction of killing the same man over and over. Mm-hmm. I guess it's the only man that you can get satisfaction of killing because it's you know it's the same man over and over. Yeah. <laughs> but like, that's really not much. What's he just he's angry with uh Ironwood. Okay, cool. What? <laughs> what does she give you that I don't you know like Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so you're right. And Tyrion he just wants to murder, so I I guess, you know. It was the best as war ever. The Great War. What a terrible I love this war. A horrible time. Though the war itself lasted around 10 years, the century leading up to it was filled with so much tension, you might as well mm. lump them together. I was expecting the continents to be like Pangea at this point. <laughs> they just, like, pull them together so they can fight quicker. <laughs> have always been in high demand, but the Emperor of Mistral had managed to conquer nearly all that Anima had to offer. Thanks in part to an unlikely friend, mantle the two kingdoms had formed an alliance mistral provided the small kingdom with goods unavailable in the frozen tundra i'll bring you people in return mantle introduced technological innovation as well as guidance in the settlement of anima's cold northern territory it was good until it wasn't an incident in mantle led to a strange and unexpected decree the abolishment of the arts and repression of self-expression. The people mm. of Mantle had come to believe that they would be much safer from the Grim if they could simply keep the emotions of the masses in check. Makes sense. Mistral, strong, artistic Makes sense, culture. but not a great plan. Many yeah. that, that would just make my emotions alive. even more heightened if I knew I had to keep them under control Ooh. for everyone else's sake. Mistral complied. What is this and fucking customer service? Enforcing Mantle's <laughs> wishes only in the outer territories, allowing the centralized powers to continue to live as they please. If you haven't caught on yet, Mistral's full of jerks. The people of Vale had a problem with this. Well, they had a problem with a lot of things Mistral and Mantle had been up to. Treatment of their citizens, use of slave labor, and their constant insistence. It's weird because Mistral is, uh, is was where Leonhard was at. And Eventually, it seems pretty Mistral diverse, you know? Across the mm-hmm. sea to the eastern <clears throat> coast of Samus. The small islands and 
peninsulas in the area were perfect to establish a settlement. The continent looks like a lion They head. were so perfect, in fact. I see that. just realized that. They had yes, just I begun always. settling the area themselves. And I we think got we can all guess what happened next. The King of Vale did everything he could to avoid armed conflict. Uh, Aspen? Despite cries from his people, yeah. he insisted on sharing the land with the settlers from Mistral. To this day, no one knows who shot first. Salem. But what began as a riot between Gee, man, she's like, pew, and then disappears. <laughs> suddenly becomes just the first battle of the great. I can war. see that. Mantle quickly came dude, dude, and they just fucking start running. <laughs> Battles were fought on both Samus and Anonymous Soul. Villages were lost to both combat So I guess Vacuo doesn't play a part in this. Not long before Vacuo decided oh. to join the Oh, they did. Okay, I spoke too soon. Up to this point, Vacu had done its best to stay out of the fight. Mandel and Mistral, having both already established a small presence in Vacuo territory years before, promised to leave them provided they didn't interfere. Mm. Soon, those talks evolved. It went from don't side with them to Enjoy. side with us and you'll be safe. Vacuo did not much care for that. When they came to the conclusion Veo were to fall, and there'd be no one left to stop Mistral and Mantle from conquering them next. True. It would be considered to be the logical thing. They drove Mantle and Mistral out of Vacuo and told Veo they had their backs. <laughs> I love their style. I'm back here for uh, where so Sony's from. raged on. Grim attacks increased worldwide. On the battlefield, this meant a temporary ceasefire in order to deal with the hordes of monsters. And then went back at it. Yeah. <laughs> Those left miserable back at home, however, were often helpless with their best warriors away fighting the good fight. A lot of settlements were lost during these years, and most were never reclaimed. Rations on food and dust were put into effect. Development of technology accelerated. Humans and faunas who fought alongside one another became closer. And every day, mankind grew more and more efficient at destroying itself. No. Makes all the sense in the world. It all ended in the Vacuo campaign. Mistral and Mantle knew that if they could take the dust mines of Vacuo, they would effectively cut off the supply of dust to their enemy. It was to be a final devastating blow to Vale and Vacuo. They were only half right. The King of Vale personally led his army into battle alongside the soldiers of Vacuo and decimated the enemy forces. Crown atop his head and armed I, only I guess, like Ospin. Yeah, I mean, like, and he even has a cane back there. I don't know if yeah, you saw. Yeah. Because. Uh, As the sand was like, soaked red with blood. At this point. Grim. There's no magic in the world, but so if it's Ozpin versus like a hundred humans, yeah, it, it, it works. Let's get yeah. over. The warrior king were born that day. Historians will tell you most of these stories are nothing but grandiose hyperbole. Unusually violent weather conditions combined with Mantle's unfamiliarity with the desert combat are likely what led to such a high death count. But whatever the reasoning, Everyone bowed to the King of Vale by the time it was over. The Great War had ended. The world was ready to live under the rule of Vale. But the King refused. The leaders of the Four Kingdoms met on the island of Vital, and it was there that they worked together to hmm. form a treaty the and Vital establish Festival. the future of Ren. Ah! I'm a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like the cultures of yep, like the hey, government restructuring and the warrior king, the last king Vale would ever have, founded the Huntsman Academies and placed his most trusted followers in command of each kingdom school. He would teach the world to fight so long as we promise to fight for ourselves. I'm a fucking <laughs> love. <that. laughs> Seems like we have kept our end of the bargain all right so I'm, I'm assuming that at that point he may have had power of all the relics or because then like he said that he at that point whenever they start creating the schools almost uh yeah the, okay yeah that that would make sense 
And it's like, damn, where do they come from at that point? Yeah, um, so, so probably he did have them all. He just didn't uh, call the call the gods. Or probably after that point, he created the schools first and then slowly found the things to give it away. You know, type of thing. I don't know. Like, I'm trying maybe. to wonder. Um, I think it's funny. They probably met on Vital and they were like, or Ozpin was like, all right, listen up. So I know, like, we had this big war, but I got this crazy bitch of a wife. So we need to build four <laughs> schools. Like, you saw that shit? That, that, that time is like 12, all right? Like, I don't think nothing. All right? Me, if I couldn't die. That's <laughs> what. <laughs> I do wonder if that. Uh, it has to, because you're, you're, you can see it still whenever he still had the sword. You can still see the 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 cane. So it had to have been him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, like, my, my thought process is like, where did he find the time to become a king after being depressed for so long, you know, and, you know, trying not to fight, you know, fucking thousands of years, I guess. Who knows? So what strange. Or was it like right after, uh, because he still like, he did have that one following with her, you know, at one point. So I wonder if it was it right after and he kind of like showed his, you know, I don't know, power or whatever. It's like, oh, well, I guess he is a, uh, a, a long lost son of, you know, this, you know, whatever and that's how he started becoming having like becoming a king in that area but i don't know i just feel like where where we left off with both him and and salem together it doesn't seem like kings were a thing already like kings have already stopped so there's a there's not necessarily plot holes but like I, we don't know where everything took place on you got to do head cannon for sure yeah. it's yeah it's weird when they keep it like open ended like that you can't you don't really have all the concrete answers yeah uh, but I don't know. That's still good information to know. I, I did like that the war part, uh, the Great War. is definitely something that we've never actually explored. We've definitely mentioned it multiple times, but nothing like this. Uh, mm-hmm. I like the fact that like Bakio seems to be the the place where most of the phonics were at at one point, and then everything just you know shuffled in. I because uh, again like that's where and it makes sense because if we go back to I think it's volume two. Uh yeah, that's whenever we got the train wreck. And whenever that happens, and we have all schools together, you could see all the schools, and you had Atlas being all mili- militant looking, mm-hmm. and then you had uh Haven also having their uniforms. We had our uniforms for some odd reason, but then you have Baku being very casual, like wearing re- whatever the fuck. Yeah. Uh, but in in our school, you had uh, most people with the uniforms, but you also had our teams, both of Juniper and thing in their you know. So I think that was to symbolize that we follow some sort of order, but we also like to be casual. It's probably like a fifty fifty type of thing, but it makes sense that they were also part of like oh fuck uh, the band on art type of thing. I guess we're done with this. Yeah, sadly. This is definitely the wrap-up. So, uh, this being the last video, Ruby, anything for the time being, of course. We have no idea when we're recording Ruby again. Yeah, that is definitely it. So, if you have any other suggestions that what might want y'all might want to take the Ruby slot, by all means, let us know in the comments. Uh, we already had a video already letting y'all know that we were no longer doing Ruby for the time being until we are able to synchronize our schedules again, uh, mm-hmm. which might take a bit. Just like that, uh, where it's unexpected how or not, like when I'm going to restart, you know. Just multiply that pause by about 13,857. Yes. Uh- <laughs> I'm actually wondering what the math is on that. <laughs> it's like eight seconds, so I don't know. Do you actually see somebody in the fucking comments? Well, actually, if you, you know, multiply by pi and sort of... <laughs> no, but for real. So by all means, let us know. Uh, there's going to be another thing either taking the slot or we'll actually be feeding more into the um, time exclusive side of Patreon. So by all means, mm-hmm. also be on the lookout. There, You're going to see it on the little mid-screen section of the upcoming videos, I guess. Yes. It will let you know. Alrighty, well, this this was uh, quite a wonderful world of Remnant. Yeah, hopefully by the time that we do start Volume 8, we actually have our OCs printed, paged, 
and explained for you guys. We really want to. It will be fun to have a whole podcast about just that. It's just a matter of like getting somebody to do the uh, art and the time to write everything down and kind of like all the weaknesses. Not, not weaknesses, but all the things of our characters and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So yeah, kind of like a D and D campaign. It's, you know, D and D. It's kind of kind of kind of be lengthy. I don't pl- I don't play that shit. I'm not I'm not a nerd. Yeah, exactly. All right, I gotta go play Mario. <laughs> so let's. Uh... <laughs> All righty. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, we'll see you in the next one. All right, see ya. The joke was that I don't, I don't play D&D. I'm not right. All right, Mario 64 is calling you in. Hope you guys enjoyed another Weeps Closet reaction. A special thanks to our Patreons. We appreciate your extra support to keep this channel going. Be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment down below, and subscribe to stay up to date with our latest videos. See you in the next one.